So thank you all for joining us for a live conversation about building communication skills through virtual simulation in an online or hybrid classroom environment. I'm your NHA host, Kayla Steffen. The format of today's webinar will be part Q&A and part demonstration. We'll be assessing NHA simulation resources that you can use um, for your online or, or hybrid programs as, this fall. Our goal is to give you strategies for engaging your students through the NHA Skills Builder solution. And we've got some best practices that Dory and Michelle have discovered after leaning on NHA Skills Builder solution in a remote learning setting. Again, thank you for being here and thank you for being active participants. Please submit your questions at any time in the Q&A or in the chat box. We'll be asking for your feedback a couple of times throughout this presentation through the poll feature. So please share your answers with us when the poll comes up. A quick housekeeping note, we strongly encourage interacting with each other in the chat box. I can see some of you going already, which is wonderful. Um, we'll have some NHA representatives monitoring the chat. So feel free to ask questions. If we miss your question, please know that we will follow up with you personally via email. Finally, we'll send out a follow-up email to everyone tomorrow that contains this webinar recording, as well as some other resources that you can use as you plan for fall. So now let me allow, allow me to introduce you to our specialist for today's presentation. Michelle, let's start with you. Michelle, I think you're on mute. You are correct. So sorry about that. It's okay. Well, everyone. Uh, as she stated, my name is Michelle Heller. I work as a content strategist and product development at NHA. Uh, before coming to NHA, my 30 plus year background included a mixture of working as a medical assisting practitioner in the field, as an office manager, as an allied health educator, a medical assisting program director, and a textbook author. And I'm so excited to share with you all today. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michelle. Meg, over to you. Hi, hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meg Sutton, and I work in the NHA Product Development Group. My area of emphasis is in medical assisting and new product innovation, such as personability and principles of health coaching. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Meg. And Dory, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about your role at City College of San Francisco? Hey, I am Dory Rinkin. I am the chair of the healthcare technology department at City College of San Francisco. It has eight different programs in it, uh, medical assisting, health information technology, uh, EMT and paramedic, EKG technician, CBT echo technician, pharmacy technician, lobotomy, and unit coordinator, which is a non-credit program but is moving to credit in the spring. I'm also the program director for the medical assisting program and has been for about 30 years. Excellent. Very good. Well, you're certainly a wealth of knowledge, Dory and Meg and Michelle, and we're really thankful to have you joining us today. Thank you so much. Um, so to kick off our session today, you'll find your first polling question on the screen. Let's take about 30 seconds or so here for everyone to provide some feedback. We really want to make sure that we're connecting with you all and discussing the trends that you're seeing. So your first poll question is, what is the most common skills gap or need that you're hearing from employers? Or if you are an employer, what is the most skills, common skills gap or need that you have? Um, are the, is it the hard skills, so things like vital signs and patient preparation, uh, soft skills, communication, empathy, um, critical thinking, or are you hearing about both, or have you not heard of any skills gaps? Go ahead and we'll give it about uh, four or five more seconds here. Okay, we can go ahead and end the polling, Julie. Very good. So uh, the results show about 57% of you are hearing about um, a soft skills gap with, uh, with the soft skills. So uh, we really appreciate that feedback. And um, honestly, that's pretty much in line with what we're seeing as well. So um, 
if I can get my slide to switch here, there we go. Uh, yeah, that's definitely what we're hearing um, in line with the marketplace. So in a study conducted by, uh, for our industry publication Access, 93% came back and said that they didn't feel like their healthcare care professionals had adequate training on soft essential skills. And I'd like to just align with you, Dory, is, is that similar to what you're hearing from employers in your area? Yes, I've actually been hearing that for um, a couple of years, actually. Um, what we've seen in San Francisco in the Bay Area, uh, we have a very diverse population, a lot of English with second language learners. And so one of the uh, biggest problems that employers have told me that they were having is that they uh, can teach the competencies uh, with no problem, but the soft skills take a little bit more time. Um, the communication and professionalism um, are the key um, areas that they have problems with. Um, because we are such a diverse population, uh, we put a class together with a textbook and then with some materials that we had from Sacramento, um, and um, we have put in a new two-unit communications course for that. Um, and um, so we're trying to work on the soft skills, uh, which includes communication and professionalism with patients. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dory. We appreciate that feedback. And uh, let's just pause one more time to gather a little bit more feedback from the audience with one more polling question before we get to the, uh, to the uh, meat and potatoes here. Um, so the polling question is, how do you primarily teach soft essential skills or communication within your program or training? Uh, now, some of you might say, well, we use a variety of these things. So uh, select what you primarily use. So is it role play, A? Do you use some type of a resource or a tool? Do you use case studies or do you not have a formal resource? You just kind of discuss those things as you go throughout your training. Just curious to see what people are doing to engage their students um, for these soft skills. Good, about two more seconds here. Okay, you can go ahead and end the polling there, Julie. Looks like about a little over half of you are using some role play type scenarios, kind of another mixed bag. Some use um, additional resources and tools. So um, we appreciate that feedback. It's always just good to get a pulse on what people are doing and hopefully we'll provide you with some solutions today to help continue to engage since you are using a lot of role play. That's tough in a distance learning environment. So we hope to um, provide you with some solutions today to help you now. So Dory, I'd like to turn over to you again. Uh, now, now we have kind of our, what were we doing before COVID and what are we doing after? So pre-COVID, you've kind of alluded to some things that you were doing uh, to engage candidates and teach soft skills. Um, now, of course, um, here comes uh, the pandemic, which definitely impacted the way that we uh, deliver our, our uh, academic programs. And your, your school was forced to pivot and you started delivering in a remote environment. So. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you were doing pre-COVID and uh, how you engaged your candidates after? So, um, as I said previously, we had developed a um, communications class. Um, we did have some communications in our administrative course, uh, but um, it just wasn't enough. So, um, we found that um, most of our students really needed an, an extra additional course. We were doing a lot of role play. Uh, and that came from both our textbook as well as the, um, the, the materials that we got from the state of California that was written specifically by medical assisting um, instructors. Um, we have a large, as I said, um, ESL population, approximately 65 to 70% on any given semester. Um, and so we, uh, when we were forced to um, shelter in place, that became very difficult to do. Um, so what I did was I looked for um, a, a different way of trying to do role play um, and simulation was what I was looking for. So we were um, trying to find a different model other than role playing. Role playing at home with your uh, relatives didn't work quite as well for students. Sure, sure. Yep, very good. Thank you so much, Dory. Now, let's loop Michelle in here. Michelle, you're a former medical assistant. You're an educator, as you alluded to earlier. So can you please share from your experience with teaching soft skills to your medical assistant students, both in the classroom and a remote learning environment? Can you just share a little bit more about your experience with that as well? Sure, Kayla. Let's just face it, it's easy to know when a learner has mastered a skill like blood pressure. You ask them to do this 
task, we perform it, and you can use quantitative measures for these types of skills. But creating assessments and activities for soft skills or essential skills like empathy is much more difficult because these skills are more nuanced and contextual, so they're much harder to assess. Additional challenges with teaching essential skills is that students don't always take role playing seriously. We all know that, right? It's difficult to come up with a variety of scenarios. We've got a lot going on. We don't have time to be trying to come up with all kinds of different scenarios. And it's <clears throat> just really difficult to be objective when you assess uh, role playing. Um, and it's even more difficult to assess these types of skills online unless you have tools like simulation to assist you. But using tools such as the Skill Builders product that you're going to learn about today is really going to help keep your students engaged when you're teaching this kind of content. It already includes the scenarios for you, so you don't have to make those up, right? It grades the simulation for you, so it's much more objective than the grading. So it's really a win for everyone, Kayla. Excellent. Thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate your feedback there. So, you know, we know right now uh, where we stand that remote learning is nearly inevitable for the fall. And that leads us back to the question of how do we effectively continue to teach these communication skills? Michelle, you've shared some great tips with us. So let's turn into Meg now. Uh, Meg, NHA's Communication Skills Builder Package incorporates virtual simulation. So before we actually look at the products themselves, can you share with us a little bit more about the methodology behind and kind of the efficacy of uh, virtual simulation? Yes, thank you, Kayla. And thank you to both Michelle and Dory. I would tell you that our research mirrors what impact you're seeing of soft skills. Um, we have heard that there is a need for soft skills training across all jobs within healthcare industry because everyone must know how to effectively communicate and interact with patients on the healthcare team. So we have had the chance to develop two two solutions that lead to improved soft skills. So that's principles of health coaching and personability. And both of these courses utilize virtual human simulation. So let me talk to you a little bit about the design principles that go into these solutions to maximize the benefit of simulation in learning. So let's look at each of these principles on the screen individually. So situated learning, and in situated learning, you, you're able to engage in a scenario that feels really realistic. In our solutions, we spend time getting the environment right for the role or the situation that we're setting up, even down to the posters on the wall, to the name tags and the, and the role that they have, and really the dialogue and communication that we build in. Next, narrative design. Narrative design is, is where you are allowing the learner to see the story from the perspective of the person that they're talking to and they have the reactions and the feelings. So for example, this think about how you would apply different techniques to somebody who is struggling with, some, uh, with a chronic healthcare condition. And in our simulations, we accomplish this by using real stage actors so that when they are recording the voice and the audio of these simulations, they're bringing in the emotion and the empathy to that voice so that it feels very realistic. Next is segmenting. And segmenting is when you don't give the learner all the information at once. Instead, you are intentionally building upon the knowledge. The characters in our simulation, much like real life, um, don't tell you everything you need to know up front. So instead, you're, as you go along in the conversation, you're learning more and more, and it changes and modifies your responses. Next is dual coding. So dual coding allows us to really address the needs of different types of learners. So we know that some, some learners prefer auditory, some experiential, and the list goes on. So when it comes to simulation design, it's really important that you take this into consideration. You build all of that into your simulations. So this allows the learner to focus in the way that they process information the best. Next is queuing. Queuing is the use of graphics to highlight or transition to show these critical elements. So examples of this would be using thought bubbles, using coaching, using on-screen text. 
And then finally, scaffolding. Scaffolding is where we're building upon the difficulty throughout the simulation. So designers look at how they can create an experience that continues to get more and more challenging to build the learner's knowledge. So as our learners are interacting with the characters, their decisions lead them down different paths and introduce different complexity. And we know that these design principles yield better outcomes. For example, we are maximizing the transfer of learning from, from long-term memory into practice. So what this means to you is that when your learners take these courses, they build what is called a mental model. So as they go on the job, they're not only re remembering um, that step-by-step -step process that they need to take, but they're also reacting to how they felt and, and what memories were created as they're going through the simulation. Simulation is always great because you can take experience to new di and different geographical areas. You can allow the learners to interact with people that they may not otherwise interact with. So this allows us to bring in diversity, inclusivity, um, among other things that we can within simulation. So let's talk about um, how this impacts um, you know, your transition into distance learning and, and focus on two products specifically. So let me take you through um, how these two products work together. And really, personability is going to lay the foundation for essential soft skills. So taking in those design principles of simulation and really bringing those in but it goes through essential soft skills. It allows the learner to go through and, um, and really interact and play different scenarios um, within all of the essential soft skills. So it gives a really solid foundation. From there, we move on to principles of health coaching. Principles of health coaching builds on those essential skills, but also expands their communication skills. This product focuses in a lot on motivational interviewing, which is one communication technique that is used a lot in healthcare. So to give you a demo and give you more information, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kayla um, to get started on that. Excellent, thank you so much, Meg. I really appreciate that uh, foundation and that background. And so now we're gonna zoom in a little bit more. We've learned a little bit more about the, about the uh, behind all of this and and uh, that was abundantly clear um, as we made the transition to uh, distance learning but um, but also even before that we were identifying these skills gaps uh, with some of our learners and so I'm going to break down each of these products now and uh, you'll hear my voice for quite a while now but I promise we'll bring back in uh, Michelle and Dory and, and Meg um, a little bit later so uh, let's zoom in now and take a closer look at uh, personability first and then we'll look at principles of health coaching so again really after listening to employers and educators NHA wanted to bring a solution to the table to help bridge this gap that we kept hearing about so personability is soft essential skills training that is specifically geared towards healthcare professionals that's interactive and really helps to build these soft essential skills and drive behavior change that's what ultimately what employers are asking for they're asking for that behavior to be different so we can create this behavior change through a really unique learning process that includes both virtual simulation and we'll show that a little bit throughout this demonstration. So let's just pause right here on this screen. We're often asked, what are the skills that are covered in personability? So on the screen, you'll see a breakdown of the various skills that we talk about throughout personability. Learners will gain an understanding of the importance of these skills to a successful career in healthcare. Now, these skills are really foundational and it to really not only just getting a job, but to keep a job, keep a job and ultimately advance in that profession. So personability is built on four main pillars. First is comprehensive learning and assessment of key essential skills. Personability is not your run of the mill click through training because it's focused on building and driving behavior change. We have learning and knowledge checks plugged in throughout. We can track user engagement and behavior change through the learner insights. And we have these robust insights that, that Michelle mentioned as being so important uh, from both the administrative and the candidate perspective. 
One of the key differentiators of personability is its simplified implementation. So personability is delivered all online, but it can really live and thrive in a variety of settings from the ground brick and mortar classroom to online distance learning to a hybrid model. And if we have to switch from one to another in the middle of a semester or in the middle of a year, there's no disruption with that. What makes personability really unique is that it takes care of a large heavy lift for instructors and facilitators by providing some really key resources that can be utilized in any of these implementation settings. We listened to educators and we learned that bandwidth is a pain point. We wanted to come alongside you and not only provide a great content solution for your candidates, but some supplemental resources to really, again, take care of that implementation heavy lift. And we'll bring in Michelle to discuss those more here uh, shortly. Finally, the true power in personability comes from the interactive practice through simulation. This is where learners, again, are truly immersed in a scenario and they can make decisions and experience consequences for their actions in a safe environment, utilizing all of those techniques and methodologies that Meg talked to us about. So here you'll see the structure of personability and we designed this using what we call gating technology. What that means is that learners must progress through uh, the learning in this order. This is how we monitor, track, and create that behavior change that we're striving for. So the learners are going to start with the baseline assessment. And what's really unique about this baseline assessment is that it is a simulation. And we'll look at that here together in just a few minutes. Now there's a couple of wins from it being a simulation. One is from the learner's perspective. The simulation engages and immerses them right away. So it's a fun way for the learners to start this learning. The second win is from an administrative and, from, and from an instructional perspective. It really gives us a much better pulse of the soft essential skills proficiency of those candidates. I always use the analogy here of a multiple choice quiz. I think we can all probably fluff our way through a multiple choice quiz on soft skills, but and we're probably going to walk out of that looking maybe a little bit better than what we actually are. But if we engage learners in a simulation and immerse them in this scenario where uh, they're making decisions and experiencing consequences for their actions, we're going to get a much better pulse on that soft essential skills proficiency so that we know where and how to start building from there. So this really establishes this point from which we'll continue to measure that behavior change and performance through the rest of the learning. After the baseline assessment, the didactic essential skills learning modules will be unlocked. There's five of those. These, are, these really set the foundation by providing learners with a description of essential skills and listing and defining skills that are particularly important in healthcare. And again, they'll gain an understanding of the importance of these to a successful career in healthcare. As I mentioned, this is not a click-through training. So after the didactic modules, they'll see a midpoint assessment that uses some case study type questions and your more traditional multiple choice questions to assess their knowledge on the essential skills learning modules. Once they pass that midpoint assessment, they'll see two practice simulations um, and candidates have unlimited access to these two practice simulations. Once they feel prepared, the candidates can then take the final assessment, which is also a simulation. The proof of completion is a certificate of completion um, and we'll provide some tips and techniques for how to talk about that on a resume or in a job interview or in a uh, how to indicate it on your LinkedIn profile or in your uh, externship interview, things like that. Um, so personability lives on the NHA certification portal, the same place where candidates might go to access our study guides and practice tests is the same place where personability lives. And so as I launch into the product here, we'll see that gating technology right when we open it. Looks like Zoom's putting a little bit of a, um, a pull on my internet. There we go. So when we see that gating technology right when we open uh, the products, so we start with the baseline assessment, move to those didactic modules, etc. Now there's a check mark here on the baseline assessment. That's because I've already completed it, which has allowed us to un now unlock these didactic modules. We'll come back and take a look at the baseline assessment, um, which is a simulation. But while we're here, let's take a look at these uh, uh, didactic modules just to show you what the structure of those look like. Um, so we can have some flexibility inside of this gate. So if we want to do the teamwork module before communication, we have the flexibility to be able to do that. Um, I'm opening one of the modules here just to give you a view of, of what your learners will see or what you'll see. 
So the first thing we see up in the upper corner here is time spent. That doesn't mean that our learners are limited in their time, but it means that that's something that we can monitor and track. Again, that's very important in terms of tracking your student engagement um, when we're talking about some type of a remote or a distance learning environment to be able to track that engagement. Uh, we also have a textual component so candidates can read this or a play audio to where this can be read to them. Um, very simple to navigate through the modules. The content is what we say is brief but brilliant. So basically meaning it's really meaningful content and some short stints to keep your learners engaged. We understand that their bandwidth is limited too. And so we've plugged in things like case studies and journaling prompts and some multiple choice questions just to keep them engaged. Again, navigation is very simple. In addition to those engaging things that we use for the candidates, we've also plugged in some professional points of view. Here's where they'll hear from an industry professional about whatever the topic is. In this case, we're looking at emotional intelligence. So here the candidates can hear from an RN for 38 years about the importance of emotional intelligence, some examples of how that's really played a role in her career. And we won't just hear from Devin here, we're, we'll hear from a wide variety of industry professionals. I think Michelle's in there um, a couple of times uh, giving us some great feedback Feedback. So really reinforcing um, what the candidates are learning. Speaking of reinforcing, we have some resources built in and these are what I call um, either tools to reinforce that content or the really the scrubbers and the polishers of those skills. So one of those items is some self reflection activities. Now these are optional, they're not required in order to complete person ability, but as an instructor um, or an administrator, if you'd like to require these, you can. Uh, so this is a fillable PDF. It's already done for you. You don't have to do any heavy lift. Um, so here we're looking at the various elements of good communication and ranking those by importance or ranking those by ability. Clearly, whatever the student is ranking lower for their ability is something they should probably spend some time self-reflecting on and kind of work through that. So again, this is a fillable PDF. Um, we look at things like communication, we look at character, professionalism, others' perspectives. So uh, they can download this and easily email that to the instructor or upload to the LMS. Uh, we also have a response sheet here for the case studies. So we saw some of the case studies as I showed the didactic content. Uh, we have 19 case studies built throughout personability. And this is just taking those a step deeper. So let's think about those in a different way or let's take a step further and really lean into that case study um, a little bit deeper uh, than what we were able to just answer those multiple choice questions. So uh, you can assign these out. You can assign all 19 or you can uh, have them just do a select few, whatever might be the most relevant uh, for your class. Class, but it's again another way to really reinforce the content or to use later. Maybe you've implemented personability early on in the program, but prior to externship, you want to do some scrubbing and polishing of those skills before they go out. Or you get an externship report and you say, hey, let's revisit uh, this technique. So these are a great way to do that. And Michelle will share some tools with you later um, that are great for that as well. Finally, uh, we have a reference sheet here on some problem solving techniques and steps. One of the things we heard from employers is, you know, as part of these foundational essential soft skills is the ability to think critically. And so throughout person ability, we introduce a three step method for problem solving called AIM. That stands for align, inquire and make a plan. No action needed with this. This is just a reference sheet. So a lot of employers will say, hey, let's hang this in a break room or let's hang this um, somewhere where our employees can access it. Or for educators, it's a great tool and resource for your candidates to print off and to really study um, a little bit deeper. So if you're thinking about like things like asking open-ended questions, instead of saying this, use this. So it's a great resource uh, that they can utilize as well. So those are the didactic modules. Let's close out here and let's dial back and take a look at this baseline assessment, which is a simulation. And I'm really excited to share that with you today. Uh, so on your screen, this is that baseline assessment. Again, it is a simulation. Um, I want to just point out a couple of things really quickly before we play this. So um, one is the learners will have someone that comes on the screen for them that sets up the stage and says, hey, here are the goals for your simulation. These are the things that you're gonna see today and, the, and this is what you're trying to accomplish. I'm gonna do that for us today just to save a little bit of time. The other thing I wanna point out is that no clinical skills are necessary or required to complete person ability. Um, we're solely focused on those soft essential skills. So if you're not quite there yet in your program, or if, those aren't, if that's not the audience that you're working with, that's okay as well. So I'm gonna play this out for us uh, just to give you an idea of how the simulations uh, look and feel. Ferguson, better now that I'm back here, but man, I didn't think you were ever gonna call my name. 
I'm sorry. We had an office emergency earlier, and now we're running a little behind. But thanks for waiting. So you're here for an injection for a pollen allergy, is that right? Same time every month, and I never had to wait like that before. All right, so now we're given the opportunity to engage with this simulation. So when we click on this talk button here, we'll see some of those things that Meg talked to us about. So we can choose to give information and just tell them, hey, we get really swamped in the afternoons. Or we can agree with them and say, I understand waiting to be seen can be really frustrating or everyone gets frustrated when they have to wait. Now, based on what we choose, the simulation will play out accordingly. So we have three possible responses here. Each of these is gonna warrant a different reaction from Mr. Ferguson, so the candidate truly experiences a consequence for their action. Again, you might call it a choose your own adventure. We call it branching technology. Um, so I'm just gonna select this and let's see what happens. I know, it can be frustrating to wait out there when we get behind. It's like, if I wanted to watch a Celebrity Scandals Marathon, I could do that at home. I wouldn't take off work for it. Well, I appreciate your patience. I'm going to let it stop right there. I just wanted to show one interaction there. This continues. Um, so oftentimes we're asked, how long do these simulations last? And the answer is, it depends. It really depends on that branching pathway that your candidates take um, in the simulation. So if they stay on a relatively good path, this particular simulation can take anywhere between about 12 and 15 minutes. Um, but if they keep Mr. Ferguson relatively escalated, I've seen this one last um, you know, uh, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so it really just varies on that branching pathway uh, that the learner takes. Um, so to pause back on uh, the slide again, so we've seen the baseline assessment. We saw the didactic learning modules. As mentioned, then they have to take a midpoint assessment. Once they pass that, they can unlock two practice simulations, and I'll just share with you the environments for those. I won't let those play out. So one of those is all about problem solving with a coworker. Now this, they can come back and keep repeating as many times as they'd like. So they can say, hey, I wonder if I would have said this or done this differently. How would the situation or how would the scenario have played out? And so um, this is really pr focused in on using that three-step aim methodology that we talked about uh, earlier to work out this problem with a coworker. The other practice simulation is set in this environment. So this is all about receiving professional feedback. And we heard a lot from our employers that we work with and our, from our various advisory board members and steering committee members that uh, this was a very important topic to include. And so uh, this is all about practice talking with a supervisor and, and practice receiving professional feedback. Many of our candidates don't have that experience or some do, and but it's something I think that we all could use a little practice on. You can see that virtual coach feature that Meg was talking about. So we have uh, the ability to undo some of our decisions or we can have a virtual coach and we can seek some um, advice from them as we go as well. The final assessment for person ability is set in this environment. So again, no clinical skills are necessary or required, really just focused on bringing all of those things together that we've heard about. So I would say this just uh, has a special focus on expressing empathy and asking open-ended questions. So let's uh, land right here again. I know we've seen this slide, but I like to just level set before we go on. So we've set the foundational skills through personability and through those soft essential skills. And now let's really uh, introduce uh, principles of health coaching. Um, so the graphic here of the building blocks or the career ladder really depict again how personability and principles of health coaching work together so well. So principles of health coaching is now going to come in and really expand on those communication skills to help improve patient engagement, adherence, and education. So let's take a closer look at principles of health coaching. So to give a little bit of background and why behind principles of health coaching, a majority of our nation's healthcare spending is on chronic conditions. So things like diabetes and cancer and obesity. And as a nation, we're spending more of our GDP on healthcare than any other developed nation, but we're producing some of the poorest outcomes. So given these challenges, the industry believes that there's a need to educate other healthcare professionals outside of just the health coach and the physician on how to actively engage patients in their treatment plans. In fact, most practices don't have full-time health coaches. It's just not part of their structure or something that they can afford. So the American Academy of Family Physicians has verified this as well. They say that health coaches can be nurses, social workers, medical assistants, community health workers, LPNs, uh, uh, health educators, 
if they're given the appropriate level of training and support. So NHA also validated this trend and you can see the results of our qualitative survey here on the right. Um, so ultimately this research showed that the practice of health coaching needs to happen by multiple members of the care team before patients walk out the door so that they adhere to their treatment plans and ultimately uh, have better outcomes as a result. So this leads us to NHA solution principles of health coaching and let's just pause right here and talk about the name principles of health coaching. So this is not making someone a health coach. Instead, principles of health coaching is focused on upskilling or career laddering or professionally developing those in the clinical care roles uh, that have a high level of patient engagement that we identified on our previous slide. So you're still working in the capacity of a nurse or of a medical assistant, etc. Um, but you're we're really expanding on their skill sets and bringing in this additional skill set. So this is a high level content outline. Now there's four modules that make up principles of health coaching. Module four includes three virtual simulations where the candidates can actually practice some motivational interviewing techniques and we'll talk about that more here shortly. So just to give you an idea of what's covered, uh, module one includes topics like how health coaching techniques play a role in population health management and, um, and, and how they play a role in preventing chronic disease and, and impacting overall health outcomes. Module two talks about collaboration and communication and candidates will learn basic communication and engagement techniques and how to deal with barriers and communication. We'll talk about some evidence-based communication approaches, such as the teach-back methodology for engaging patients. We talk about some considerations for telephone communications and various methods and best practices for electronic communications and considerating considerations uh, for when you're communicating with patients electronically. I think as we continue to navigate uh, the COVID situation and we see more telehealth, um, we might see this um, really continue to rise for our professionals. Module three is going to talk through relationships, professional boundaries, and responsibilities. Um, so some of the responsibilities that are reviewed are things like disease prevention and management and collaboration with healthcare providers and medication review and educating patients. Um, this module also talks about cultural differences. I saw a brief chat uh, earlier about asking about that. So we'll talk about cultural differences, psychological and emotional health, and social determinants of health. And then finally, module four will provide us with some didactic foundational content on principles and techniques for motivational interviewing. And this again will end with three virtual simulations where the candidates can practice their motivational interviewing uh, techniques. And this just shows a snippet of what those look like. I won't go into those actual simulations. The way in which they play out is just like it does in uh, personability. So just to dive a little bit deeper here um, on motivational interviewing to give some context, motivational interviewing at a high level is a key communication technique that helps to empower patients to help themselves. And to go a little bit deeper, um, it's a counseling method that um, and, and a conversational method that helps patients to maybe resolve some ambival ambivalent feelings and insecurities um, and to find the internal motivation that they need to change their behavior. Um, so we're really excited to have been able to plug in these three motivational interviewing simulations where candidates can actually practice these skills and receive some instant feedback and revise their decisions um, as they practice that skill set. So as an educator, you can see there's a lot of wins here from multiple standpoints from an, education, an educator perspective. This is aligned to meet programmatic competencies pertaining to effective communication and health coaching can really help distinguish your program and your students in the marketplace. Motivational interviewing simulation gives your students a safe environment for some experiential learning. Um, from the student's perspective, upon successful completion, they'll get a certificate validating their competency. So this can be used for things like resume building that we talked about earlier and uh, for future career laddering and ultimately gives them the confidence to effectively communicate as they enter the workforce. Finally, what we're all here for is the patient. So this really helps the patient to gain the knowledge and the skills and the tools that uh, and the confidence ultimately that they need to become active participants in their overall health care and to have better outcomes. So you've heard a lot of my voice um, and said so I apologize for that. So let's bring Michelle back in now. Uh, Michelle, as NHA talked to educators and employers, we kept hearing a story of bandwidth. And in training programs, there's often so many skills to cover in a limited amount of time. So NHA, as I mentioned earlier, has 
cr created some really robust instructor and facilitator resources in an effort to take care of some of that heavy lift. Um, now, Michelle, you were really instrumental in helping to create these. So can you walk us through the instructor and facilitator tools that are included with this skills builder solution? Uh, I'm happy to, Kayla. I know how hard you all work and whatever we can do to kind of uh, decrease the amount of work you have to do on our end, the better for everyone. So um, I, the communication builder offering comes with an abundance of tools. The first tool that we're going to talk about are the lesson plans. Um, the lesson plans include things like time estimates and material students will need to, in order to use skills builder. And that's really important because you have to know how to pay students. Uh, it includes content objectives that are included in the training. That way you know exactly what's going to be covered in that training. It also provides tips for using the product online and really for those schools that have had to transition quickly to something online, those tips are going to be very valuable. And the lesson plans also map the training to KHEP and APHAS standards. So if you are KHEP or APHAS accredited, you already have those standards mapped for you. Uh, the next uh, tool that we have are PowerPoint slides. I know we all love PowerPoint slides. Uh, the PowerPoint slides help to streamline the important content covered in modules. And it also adds facilitator tips, such as questions you can ask if you're going through the presentation. It also gives you some extra ideas for additional activities. And the great thing is about these slides is that you can customize them. So that's great. Um, Something I'm really excited about is we also have a library of activities in the facilities toolkit. You know how we're always wishing that we had extra activities? Well, we've got them for you. So these are extra activities that can be used outside the product in order to reinforce the content and scrub and polish those skills. Finally, we have a robust implementation guide. Now, this guide not only walks you through the features and the functions of the product, but it maps out various implementation strategies, as you can see here on page nine, as she's showing that to you. Um, this leads us into our next topic, which is to go over some best practice implementation strategies with you. Now, we've talked about the why, we've talked about the what, so this leads us now to the how. So if you're an educator, you may be thinking about, well, where would I incorporate this training? Well, if you're an educator, consider incorporating personability into a career readiness course, maybe a health explorer course, or a professional course near the beginning of the program. Uh, some incorporate it closer to the end of the program, uh, such as in a capstone course. And other institutions break up personability and cover it over a couple of different courses, especially if there's time constraints. Uh, if you're a healthcare employer, we have some options for you as well. You may want to consider incorporating personability into the onboarding process. That's a great place to put it. Um, you might offer personability as a professional development course and have employees work in groups or independently. Uh, you may use personability as a career laddering opportunity. So that's something that really will give uh, employees incentive to stay with you. Maybe you can offer additional uh, money on the salary to uh, really entice them to take that. And uh, the learning guide also provides sample learning plans to make implementation easy. We know the last thing you need to do is to try to figure out how do we break this up? So we've got a variety of ways for you to bring up that content within your courses. And the great about this whole thing is that you will have access, and I saw this in the chat notes, you will have access to this product for two years. So students can use it as often as they want throughout that two-year period. They might offer it or they might use it as a refresher at the end. If you start it at the beginning of the program, it's just great that you have a variety of ways that you can use this. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate 
um, all of that insight and best practices. So um, again, we we always talk about the what and what it is, and we talked about why, and and everybody always asks, well, now how do we do that? So those are some really great tips. Uh, Dory, I'd like to uh, close up things with you again and talk a little bit about um, how you're implementing these resources in your programs and some of the feedback that you have as an educator, as well as what you've heard from your students after completing the Skills Builder. Okay, so um, when I um, purchased the Perseability and the uh, Principles of Health Coaching, it was kind of done at the last minute before my work experience class. We have an eight week work experience class uh, and we were having problems with placements obviously due to the pandemic. So um, I was looking for um, it to work on some of the hours why students waited for a placement and um, I felt that um, it was good independent study for them also. Um, so what I did was I took most of the toolbox kits, you know, the, the items from the toolbox and actually placed them on the Canvas page. So I put in the videos um, and I um, had two different modules, one for personability, one for health coaching and um, put the videos and all the resources so students can go in there. Uh, we met weekly anyway as a class um, using Zoom. So I would check in with the students to find out how they were doing. It went very smoothly. Uh, the feedback from the students um, was very uh, positive. They enjoyed it. Some students took longer than others uh, because of the reading. So um, on the audio for a diverse uh, population like we have, uh, students read a little slower and the audio was very helpful for them. And so a lot of them actually used the audio feature. Um, the uh, facilitator toolkit I thought was a very, very good resource that you can pick and choose uh, what I wanted them to actually complete. Um, I also like the reporting because I could check weekly before our um, meetings um, that I had with them to see who's who's where um, and um, if there were any problems with them moving on from one module to the other. Um, I had a lot of positive feedback from students. Um, they felt that they learned a lot. Um, they did say that it was a lot of reading, which is why the audio tool is good. Uh, but one of my students actually had, um, who was placed in an in a, um, office in Chinatown, um, where the culture there is a little bit different and um, there was an incident in the office and she said that she, to handle the situation, she actually used uh, one of the simulations, difficult patient situation. Um, she would, uh, went back and thought about what she did in the, in the simulation to kind of help. And she said it also calmed her down a little bit uh, for her first kind of negative interaction with a patient. Um, so um, it worked out really well for me. Um, if I have more timing next year, I plan to do things a little bit more um, uh, in depth um, than we had uh, going into this because we really did um, sort of implement it very quickly, but it all went well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dory. That's that's helpful feedback. And I love the story about your student referring back to um, thinking back to the simulation. And that's why it's there, right? Hey, I, I've already experienced this consequence here. So it's easy for me to recall that information. And um, to no fault of your own, you had to pick things up quickly, as, as I'm sure others on the line can relate to um, last spring. And, and uh, so uh, as time goes on, we can certainly work with you on um, a, a uh, more, more uh, a long-term uh, implementation solution since it looks like we might be in this phase for a little while uh, longer. So thank you so much for that feedback. That's wonderful. Um, so we've come full circle and I'm gonna land right back here on this slide where we started. So uh, we've learned that there's a skills gap with, uh, there's a gap with soft skills and communication skills from both educators trying to teach them and employers looking for candidates that have these polished skills. We've learned about how personability and principles of health coaching come together to create the communication skills builder package with personability laying the key foundational skills and principles of health coaching um, building and expanding the communication skills, particularly around that motivational interviewing component. We learned all about the implementation of the resources that NHA has created to support your instructors and uh, that Michelle shared with us and some implementation best practices from Dory and Michelle. So let's end our time together hearing from you, the audience, one more time uh, with one more polling question. So um, I'll pull that up here on the screen and just very simply, have you decided what online resources you'll be using in the fall? Um, yes, it, you have everything ready to go, or if you'd like to learn, even if you have everything ready to go, if you'd like to learn a little bit more about uh, NHA Skills Builder communi Communication Package and Solution uh, that we discussed today, uh, indicate that, and we're certainly happy to provide some more information. 
As you're providing your responses uh, to the poll, I'd just like to extend my sincere thanks to Dory, Michelle, and Meg for your valuable insights today. We're really grateful to all of you for taking time to join us. And again, we'll be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow that contains um, a recording of this webinar, as well as some supplemental resources that may help as you continue building out your fall plans. If you asked a chat question that we didn't quite uh, uh, get addressed, we'll reach out to you personally to follow up uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, finally, I just again want to thank you all for your time. We really appreciate everything that you're doing to advocate on behalf of your students. And please know that NHA is here to support you in any way that we can. So thank you all so much for your time. We hope you have a great day. Thank you.